You can catch us live on YouTube, Joy Learning Television, or on Facebook, Joy Learning TV. I'm glad to come your way with review show on physics or in physics. And next, Fabi Albert is my name as usual. And you can call me Pius. Tonight, I'm so happy to be here because I know we are going to have a very great time as we go through the show. So, get yourselves prepared as we start. Tonight, we will start by looking at the problem of the day. During the tail end or at the tail end of the show, you will be given the opportunity to phone in or call in and answer questions on the problem of the day so that if we are satisfied with your answer, we will be able to reward you. So, let's begin with the problem of the day. It says, a projectile is launched with an initial velocity of 60 meters per second at an angle of 40 degrees above the horizontal plane. Find the horizontal displacement of the projectile after three seconds. And then we are asked to find the height reached by the projectile after three seconds. That's our first question on projectile motion. And I am sure you have come across the question already and you are trying to get your hands around the solution. Question number two for problem of the day. Well, for the first one, we'll be giving G to be 10 meters per second squared. Number two says, kinetic energy Ke has units kg m squared s minus 2. It can be written in terms of momentum P and mass as k is equal to p squared on 2m. And now we are asked to deduce the units of momentum using dimensional analysis. So we've been given the units of kinetic energy. It can be written in terms of momentum and mass as k equals p squared on 2m. Then we are required to deduce the units of momentum using dimensional analysis. Then our last question for problem of the day. It says, which of these has a higher conductivity, an N-type semiconductor or a P-type semiconductor? Explain your answer briefly. So we have an N-type and a P-type semiconductor. Which of them has a higher conductivity? And then we are asked to explain our answer briefly. So viewers, cherished viewers, that is the problem of the day. Take your time and go through it as we go through the class. And then we'll be given a chance to let us have your answer in due time. Okay, so let's move on. Tonight, I'm going to take time to take you through part one or some of the topics that appear in part one of the WASI physics paper. We have part one and we have part two for the theory. For the part one, as we know already, we have seven questions and we are asked to, or we'll be asked to answer five out of those seven questions. Now, we have questions or topics that come under this particular, or that fall under this particular part one. And one of them is dimensional analysis or dimensions of physical quantities. So tonight we'll take time and go through dimensions. It's a revision show. So we are going to just look at the salient, the important points, and when we move along. Then another topic that usually comes there is projectile motion. So we take time and also go through the needed points to remember as far as projectile motion is concerned. Then if you have enough time, then we'll go ahead and look at something little on electronics. So let's set the ball rolling. Let's begin with dimensions of physical quantities. When we say the dimensions of a physical quantity, what are we referring to? What do we mean? Usually we say dimensional analysis of a physical quantity. So now when you are asked to write or what is the dimensions of a physical quantity, then we are saying that it is an expression. The dimensions is an expression of that physical quantity in terms of the fundamental quantities mass, length, 
and time, expressed as M, L, and T. So in summary, all I'm saying is that when you are asked to write down the dimensions of a physical quantity, then you are asked to put down an expression in the first case. So the dimensions will give you, or the dimensions are an expression. And that expression involves mass, length, and time. In other words, you are going to show us how the physical quantity relates to mass, length, and time. How does the physical quantity you're talking about or you'll be given relate to mass, length, and time? That becomes the dimensional analysis or the dimensions of that physical quantity. So the dimensions of a physical quantity is just an expression of that physical quantity in terms of mass, length, and time. And in this case, you represent the mass by capital M, the length by capital L, and the time by capital T. We could also say that the dimensions of a physical quantity are the powers, the powers to which mass, length, and time are raised in order to represent that quantity. So the powers to which mass, length, and time are raised in order to represent that quantity. So we are talking about only the three most important, well, if I should put it, fundamental quantities in physics, which is mass, length, and time. So in your dimensions, you're going to only be talking about mass, length, and time. Here, MLT, MLT, and take note, they are in capitals, or they are capital letters. M, capital M, capital L, capital T. So we are going to just be writing some expressions that involve M, L, and T. That is it. As simple as that. So quickly, let's move on. How do we represent them? I have a table for you. So we are going to represent mass by M, capital M, length by L, capital L, time by T, capital T. Take notice. So mass, capital M. Length, capital L, time, capital T. That is how you are going to represent the dimensions. Okay, how is it written? Things to note. Number one, a square bracket is used to show that a physical quantity is being expressed in its dimensions. So, if you have a physical quantity and you want to express that in its dimensions, then you have to use a square bracket. And let's pick an example. We are saying that we are going to use mass, length, and time. So I have mass like this. This is just mass. If I should put mass in square bracket, then I have this. Then it's no more just mass. It is telling me that or all, all I'm saying is that I'm going to write the dimensions for mass. Then that becomes capital M. We can look at length. This is just ordinary length. So, if I should put length in square bracket, then it means I am going to write the dimension for length which is capital L, then time. This is just time. If I should put it in square bracket, it means I'm going to write the dimension for time, and that would be a capital T. So take note that a square bracket is used to show that a physical quantity is being written or is being expressed in its dimensions. Number two. There are quantities we call non-dimensional quantities. These quantities do not have dimensions. So when we encounter them in problems we're supposed to solve, we ignore them because we can't find their dimensions. Why? 
most of the time, most of these quantities do not have units. It's, it's not all the, time, all, all the time, though, but most of the times, some of these quantities do not have units, SI units. So we can't really write down their dimensions. I'm going to give some examples. Well, I have constants. So 2, 50, pi, all these are constants. They are non-dimensional quantities. They are dimensionless. Relative density. The ratio of probably density of a substance to density of water. So because you have density as numerator, density also as the denominator, the units of these uh, quantities will cancel out and you don't have a unit for RD or relative density. In that case, we are saying that they are non-dimensional quantities. Their dimensions cannot be found. Mechanical advantage, ratio of load to effort, dimensionless. Velocity ratio, distance moved by effort on distance moved by load. Distance numerator, distance denominator. We cancel out, the units cancel out. They don't have a unit, and so we can find their dimensions. All right, so let's try and find the dimensions of some quantities. The first one is area. Then I have volume. Then let's pick the first two, area and volume. One of the things you have to take note of is this. Until you know the formula, the expression for the quantity, you cannot write down its dimension. That's pretty quite an issue you have to battle with. It means that you need to know the formula for a number of quantities so that when you are asked, you should know what to put down. Then you can find a dimension. So I'm beginning with area. So I'll just write area. What's the formula for area? Length times the breadth. Good. Then now I want to write the dimension for area. So I'll put area in a square bracket. So that tells me that whatever I'm going to write next should be the dimension for area. Then you ask yourself, we are talking about only three basic entities here, mass, length, and time. So length, where will it fall? It will fall under length. So L. Breath, where will it fall? Will it fall under mass, length, or time? It's also length. So L. Then now we have indices here. L times L, and that gives me L to the power 2. So the dimension for area becomes L to the power 2. Volume. So now I write volume and put on the formula length times the breadth times the height. So once I know the formula for volume, I will be able to find the dimension. Now, I put volume in a square bracket. So length, dimension will be capital L, breadth will be capital L. What about height? Height will also fall under length. So capital L. So this time I have L times L times L giving me L to the power 3. That's quite easy. So if you don't know the formula for the quantity, it will be difficult for you to find the dimension. Sometimes if you know the units for the quantity, out of the units, we can write the dimension. Let's move on. Number three, density. And then number four, velocity. So we are required to look at the dimensions for density and for velocity. So let's pick density first. What's our formula for density? Density is equal to mass per unit volume, so mass over volume. 
density will give me mass over volume. So what do I do next? I go ahead and look at the dimension. So I put density in a square bracket like that. And then mass will fall under mass, so capital M. Then volume, we just found it to be L to the power 3, so L cubed. So that gives me mass times, because the power of L, the denominator here is 3. When I make it a numerator, the power will change to minus 3, so L minus 3. Therefore, I want to get m l to the power minus 3 to become my dimension for density. It says velocity. So, velocity. What's our formula for velocity? Velocity is displacement on time. Good. So now I write velocity, put it in a square bracket. Then write the dimensions. For displacement, the dimension will be L because it is distance in a given direction. So distance, so capital L. Then time is capital T. So I will bring my time up to become a numerator. The power of time now, as a denominator is positive 1, so when it goes up to become a numerator, it becomes negative 1. So L times T to the power minus 1. And that will give me L T minus 1. It's one of the most important dimensions you should keep off head. This, the dimension for velocity. Because in most of the questions you will come across, you will need to quote this dimension and you are good to go. So keep it in mind. The dimension for velocity is LT minus 1. Okay, we can move on to the next example. Then for velocity, so we can go on to momentum. Momentum. So for momentum, what's our formula for momentum? Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So the product of mass and velocity will give me momentum. So I'll put momentum in square brackets. It means I'm going to write its dimension. And for mass, it's capital M. That's it. And velocity, just found it out. LT minus 1. So that gives me M LT minus 1. That becomes our dimension for momentum. That is not difficult. That is quite easy to deal with. Then I'm looking at acceleration and force. So we look at the two, acceleration and force. All right. So we have to write down the formula for acceleration. So acceleration is change in increasing velocity. So change in velocity In increasing velocity or weight or over time taking. As simple as that. So we put acceleration in square bracket. Velocity or change in velocity. We get from velocity to be LT minus 1. So LT minus 1. Then the time taking is capital T. This gives me LT minus 1 times also T minus 1. Because when T was a denominator down here, it had a power of 
positive 1. When it goes up, it gets a power of minus 1. That gives me LT minus 2 for acceleration. Then we have force. So, let me hammer it here that the next dimension you should keep off head is that of acceleration. Very, very important. Once you keep that in head, you know, in mind that acceleration has got a dimension of LT minus 2, you are good to go. Because you will need it to quote it as you solve many other questions. All right, so we can move on to force. Force, the formula says it's mass times acceleration. So you see, acceleration is appearing here. If I put force into square brackets, I get mass to be capital M. Then I just quote acceleration. LT minus 2. There is no need going through to solve to get acceleration again. Once you have it of head, you put, you quote it, and then you are good to go. So LT minus 2. And you put the two together, giving you M LT minus 2. M LT minus 2. That becomes the dimensions for force. That becomes the dimensions for force. Then we go on to pressure. Pressure. So, before we can write the dimensions for pressure, we need to put down its formula. So, pressure gives us force per unit area. So, force over area. So, we put pressure in square brackets. Force, mass times acceleration. So, M for the mass, LT minus 2 for acceleration. So, LT minus 2. All over, area was L to the power 2 or L squared. This gives us M, LT minus 2 times L also minus 2. Because now the L here down there has become a numerator. So, the power changes, becomes L minus 2. So now you have m, then l to the power 1 here, and l to the power minus 2 here. So 1 minus 1 here, minus 2 will give me minus 1. So m, l, minus 1. Then you have t, minus 2. So if you take your time and you carefully do it well, you will not have any problems with the dimensions. So we've had enough of quantities and then their dimensions. And you should be able to write the dimensions of other quantities. The key is that get to know the formula involved. And if you know the formula of the quantity, then you will be able to write down the dimensions. Now, I want to look at uses of dimensional analysis of physical quantities. Well, at your level, we'll look at about three uses of dimensional analysis. Now, the first one, it says to find the unit of giving quantities. So you could be given a quantity and then you will be asked or you'll be required to find the unit of that quantity by the use of dimensions. Now, let's look at an example. It says that from the relation f is equal to g m1, m2 all on d squared, g is the gravitational constant. f is the force of attraction between two bodies of masses m1 and m2, respectively. It says, with distance d apart, what is the unit of g? What is the unit of g? So, in this question, we are told that g is gravitational constant. F is the force. m1 and m2 are masses. Then d is distance. I'll, I'm going to caution you here. Whenever I'm giving, you are giving a question like this, Stick to the definition of the parameters given to you by the question or in the question. Maybe in this question, you are told that M is for mass. Good. In another question, M might not be mass. It may not be mass. It may be something else. So you stick to the definition of the terms given in the question. So in this case, we are told F is force, M1, M2, their masses. 
d is distance. So, how do we find the unit of g? In the first case, before you can find the unit of g, you have to make g the subject of the relation. So, let us try to do that. We will make g the subject of the relation. So, it says that f is equal to g m1 m2 over d squared. So, I'll make g the subject. If I cross multiply, I get f d squared equals g m1 m2. And so, g will give me f d squared divided by m1 m2. Then now, we take our time and get the dimensions of the parameters on the right hand side. When we get those dimensions, out of that, we will write the unit for g. So for f, according to the question, it's force. So mass times acceleration. Then m is mass. So m1 will be m. Then m2, so you see, I'm putting all these in square brackets because it tells me I'm going to write their dimensions. It's also m. Then d, its dimension, I thought it is distance, so l. Now, I take them back to the expression. So I'll look at g and the dimensions will give me. So the dimension of g will give me that of force, mass times acceleration times d is l, but it's d squared, so it becomes l squared, all over mass m1, so m, times another m2, m. So that gives me, because I have m as a numerator and m as a denominator, they have the same powers, they have the same base. In this case, I can't cancel them out. So this can cancel out this. Please, you can only cancel out when you have the same base and you have the same powers. So you're going to get, for the numerator, you get L, C, or let me just combine them once and for all. So I'm going to get, you have two L's up there. You have one L here, another L here, but this is L to the power one, this is L to the power two. So it becomes L to the power three, one plus two then t to the power minus 2 all over m. I want to do away with the fraction. So I will bring m up. So the dimension of g will still become m to the power minus 1. Then I'm going to get l cubed, then t minus 2. For it to be nicer, let me start with the positive. So l to the power 3, then m minus 1, t minus 2. So in this case, these are the dimensions of g, but I'm asked to find the unit of g. So then I'll say, therefore, the unit of g is, so out of the dimensions, I'm going to write the unit. So I pick the unit of the dimension is L. L stands there for Length. What are the units for length there? That gives you meter. So it is meter m to the power 3 to the cube. Then m stands for mass. The unit is kilogram. So kg. And the power is minus 1. Then t stands for time. The unit is second. So s and then minus 2. So the unit of g becomes meter cubed per kilogram per second squared. Meter cubed m3 per kilogram kg minus 1 s minus 2. At this juncture, we will go on a break or we take a breather and we will come right away and continue with our revision show. Stay tuned, we'll be back in a G feed.
Toy learning is two years. Oh, how time flies. Today, I have been a benefactor. And students in this country and beyond are also benefactors. I appreciate even how you handle the inconveniences that came with the lockdown with the COVID, even helping students to learn even in their homes. So with your two years anniversary, we say congrats and keep up the good work you are doing. We wish you success in the future. And I know that Ghanaians are expecting more from you. Two might sound very soon in a way, but Jordan has done a lot. And on this note, I would want to wish Joy Learning a happy two-year anniversary. The whole country is now into it. They are watching Joy Learning, they are learning. So I would only say that it should continue and it should work harder than before. I hope that many more students will find it not just as an appendix, but as an integral part of their learning experiences. And let's encourage our wards or our kids to watch your learning so they learn something better because day in, day out, new things are being taught. For mathematics in particular, I look forward to the day when, because of joy learning and every other such intervention, mathematics would not be feared. It would be revered, respected, loved. I mean, the kind of subject that you don't run away from when you hear it, but you embrace it. Joy learning. Joy learning. Joy learning. Joy learning. Joy learning. Joy learning. Joy Learning has given students around the world access to free content. I believe it's been two years of exciting learning on Joy Learning. That is a recommendation that Joy Learning is good. Joy Learning does have the potential to help every boy, every girl quicken what they are learning. I must say I have picked very relevant feedback from a lot of people who have been watching Joy Learning and the experience for them has been great, especially those who just wrote their BEC in WASI. They say that this program came at the right time to support them in achieving their aim of executing the agenda to pass their examination. I want to entreat all of you out there to watch Joy Learning, especially the students out there. You know why? because we keep a promise and we give you best of content in terms of education. In the Akan realm, we see that as empathy. So, for you students out there, stay connected, joy learning. Keep learning. Welcome back. We have been looking at the uses of dimensional analysis and we've gone to the first use to deduce the units of given quantities. Now, the second use of dimensional analysis is to check whether an equation is valid, correct or not. So we say we can use dimensions to check the validity of an equation or not. So, how do you go about that? Let's take an example. It says that the velocity v of longitudinal waves in air of density rho under the pressure p is given as v is equal to square root of p on rho. That's what the question is saying. That the velocity relates to density and pressure as 
V is equal to root of P or pressure on density. Then it says, is the equation dimensionally valid? Is the equation dimensionally valid? That's what they're trying to ask us. So how do we use dimensions to show or to tell whether this equation is correct or is valid dimensionally or not? Okay, let's go about it. Now, what do you do? We'll be given an equation. So we first write down that equation. We we'll do that pretty shortly. So we're given V is equal to square root of P on rho. Check again and be sure. That's it. V equals root of P on rho. Then, once again, let me see. Be mindful of the definitions of the quantities given to you in the question. According to the question, V is velocity. That's it on your screen. V stands for velocity. Rho stands for density. P stands for pressure. So we keep that in mind. Then we move ahead. So now we try to write the dimensions. So for V, it says velocity, which will be LT minus 1. For P, pressure, which is force mass times acceleration over area, which is L squared. That gives me M L minus 1, T minus 2. Then density is equal to mass over volume. So the mass over volume is L cubed. That gives me M L minus 3. Now, let's put these dimensions back into the expression. So you're going to get L T minus 1 is giving me our P is M L minus 1 T minus 2 all over M L minus 3. Now take note here. Whatever we have under a square root sign is the same as raising all that to the power half. So I'm going to raise everything I have here on my right hand side, the power half. Let me start by simplifying what I have in the brackets. So M takes away M. I can only do that because the, both have the same base, have the same power or powers. So I have LT minus 1 being equal to, now I have L minus 1, T minus 2. I'm going to bring my L minus 3 down here up to become times L positive 3. Now all to the power half. Are we good to go? Yes, we are. So LT minus 1 gives me, I'm going to simplify what I have in the bracket. So I have L to the power minus 1 times L to the power 3. It becomes L to the power minus 1 plus 3, which will give me L squared minus 1 plus 3 will give me positive 2. Then I have T minus half. Then L to the power half. So I'm going to open the bracket on the right hand side by multiplying each power in there by half. I'm going to get LT minus 1 is equal to L to the power 2 times half, then T to the power minus 2 times half. In that case, I'm going to get LT minus 1 is equal to LT minus 1. Now, an equation is dimensionally valid when each term, each term has the same dimension. In this case, if the dimensions of the term on the left-hand side of the equal to sign is equal to the dimensions of the terms on the right-hand side of the equal to sign, then we say the equation is dimensionally valid. So from what we have here, on our left-hand side, we have LT minus 1. On right-hand side, we have LT minus 1. Therefore, we will say the equation is dimensionally valid. The equation is dimensionally valid or correct. Why? Because 
each term has the same, or each term on the left and right hand side of the equal sign has the same dimension. That is the second use of dimension analysis. We can move on to the third use of dimensional analysis. And I'm saying that it is used to derive the relationship, to establish the relationship between given quantities. In simple terms, dimensions can be used to derive a formula that relates given quantities. So, how do we go about that? We try with a question. Look at this question. Quite a lengthy one. But I'll show you how to make it very simple for you. A transverse wave is traveling along a thin string of length L and mass M under a constant tension T. Assuming the string has no stiffness, it is perfectly flexible. The velocity C. So you see here, velocity is being denoted by C and not V. The velocity C of the transverse wave along it depends on the values of T, M, and L. If the mass per unit length of the string is mu, deduce the formula for C by the method of dimensions. So this is a very lengthy question. Now, how do I get it to be simple? Look out for a sentence, a statement in the question that tells you that a quantity depends on one, two, three other quantities. That is our starting point. So I go through the question again. It says that the transverse waves traveling along a thin string of length L and mass M trying to define the parameters. Constant tension T. Now we go back. It says the velocity C. So I'm going to underline that portion for you. The velocity C, it starts from here, of the transverse wave along it depends on the values of T, M, and L. That's, that's, that's the salient point I need in the question. All the other ones have tried to, to, to explain to me what C is, what T is, what M is, and what L is. But my starting point is the velocity C of the transverse wave along it depends on the values of T, M, and L. I'm going to write that one mathematically. Let's look at our selected solution. Good. So it says that the velocity C, I'll say C, depends on, so I have the sign of proportionality, the values of T, M, and L. So it depends on T, M, and L. So we cannot work with this sign of proportionality. Therefore, we change it into an equal to sign, and then we introduce a constant which is k. So c will give me k, then I have t, m, and l. What do I do next? I'm going to give them powers. Their powers will help me to know how they relate. So let me say a, b, and c. Or since I have c here, we can change and make it x, y, and z. So now we're going to get x, y and z it could be in a different order it could be x y z whichever way give the parameters powers then we move ahead and go and write down the dimensions according to the question c is velocity so its dimension will be l t minus one then t according to the question you go back to it check it it says that tension t so tension is a force. So mass times acceleration, mlt minus 2. Then for m, it says mass. That's okay. And for l, it says length. And they are in the question. Check it. So it says mass m, length l. So we are good to go. So what do we do? We put these dimensions back into the expression. I'm going to get lt minus 1 give me k, then the tension is m l t minus 2, the power is z, so we put it there, then m is the mass, so 
times m, the power is y, and l is the length, the power is x. What do we do next? Let's open the bracket to get l t minus 1 is equal to k m z l z t minus 2 z. Good. Then times m to the power y, l to the power x. Let's group like terms. So l t minus 1 gives me k. I have two m's here. So I have m, 1 to the power z, 1 to the power y. And they are all positive. So y plus z. So y plus z. Then times, I go to l. I have l here, I have l there too. Power x and power z. They are all positive. So x plus z. Then I go to t. I have only one t here. The power is minus 2z. That's it. So now we are going to compare indices of powers. So comparing the indices. You always have to start with the one with only one unknown. It makes your work easier. So I go to the expressions. I see that on my right hand side, it's t that's got only one unknown, which is z there, minus 2z as the power. What we don't know there is z. It will be easier to start with t. So I'll say for t. Now ask yourself, on your left hand side, do you have t there? Yes. What's its power? Minus 1. So minus 1 should be equal to, on your right hand side, do you have t there? Yes. What's its power? Minus 2z. Now, the negatives can cancel out. So I'm going to get 1 is equal to 2z. I'll divide both sides by, by 2. So 1 over 2 equals 2 over 2z. Then they cancel out. Right? So what will be our answer for z? So we have z giving us 1 over 2. So now, again, go ahead and pick another quantity. That has got z with another one unknown. So because you know z, you can find that one. So I can pick for, let's say, m. Or I can pick for l. Either of them has got z and one unknown. So you can pick for l. For l, on my left-hand side, what do I have for l? l is there with a the power positive 1. So 1 is equal to, on my right-hand side, l is there with x plus z as a power. So x plus z. But z is half. So 1 will be equal to x plus half. Then we make x a subject. So x will give me 1 minus the half. And that will give us half. Then we are left with the last one, which is m. So for m, on your left-hand side of the equation here, we don't have m there. So we say its power is 0. Then on the right-hand side, the power is y plus z. So y plus z. We just found z to be half. So you get 0 is equal to y plus half. That's good to go. So y will give me minus half. So we have x to be half, y to be minus half, and z is also half. So we go ahead and work. Pretty surely we'll be able to get our answer. So we got x to be half, y to be, let's be sure of it, minus half, and then z to be also half. So z is equal to half. So we go back to this equation here, where we first put in the powers, this one. And replace x, y, and z with what we have found. It's c is equal to k, t, m, l, and we had powers x, y, and z. So we have c is equal to k, t, m, l, we had x, y and z. I want to put the powers back in there. Give me c is equal to k t to the power half m to the power minus 1 on 2 l also to the power half. Good. Now we want to take away this negative sign here. So we make m a denominator. That gives you c is equal to k t half l half all over m to the power Half. Now, whatever you have, the quantity is telling us that it's reached the power half, meaning that it's under a square root sign. 
So we could write this as C is equal to K square root of T L over M. Then we have one last step. Look at the question again. Something that is very important. Check it. It says that if the mass per unit length of the string is mu, check it. Mass per unit length of the string is mu. That means in our expression, whenever or wherever we find mass over length, we should put mu there. Let's see, do we have mass over length there? Unfortunately, no. We rather have L over M. So what do we do? If mass over length is equal to mu, then L over M, you can see that it has been reciprocated. Therefore, L over M also be 1 over mu. So our answer becomes C is equal to K square root of T times 1 over mu. The final answer will give you C is equal to K root of T over mu. That is splendid. These are the things you should expect in exams and you are very, very likely to come across them in exams. Once you're able to get these at the fingertips, you really have much of a problem. We will draw the quad curtains here on dimensions and let's look at something else on projectile motion. So we are looking at projectile motion. Projectile motion is the motion of a body that describes a parabolic path. So the body is moving and when its path is traced, it's seen as a parabolic path. Maybe you have a body that moves and describe this path. That would be a parabolic path. Or it goes this way. That would be a parabolic path. It could be from a height like this. Maybe this a body is here. And it falls this way. Also a parabolic path. So anybody that moves describing any of these paths are shown, we say it's in a projectile motion. Now, practical examples of regular motion include one, the motion of a stone released from a catapult. So if you have a catapult, you put in a stone, you pull and release the stone, it moves to describe a parabolic path. The motion of a bullet shot into the air. So the bullet is shot at an angle in the air. It goes through the air this way and falls back. And this path is a parabolic path. Then we are saying that the motion of a javelin thrown into the air. So when you watch those who, the athletes who throw the javelin, it is thrown into the air, it goes high, 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 and then comes to fall at one point. And these paths, this, this path is a parabolic path. So the motion of the javelin is an example of projectile motion. Now, in these examples, the, the objects that are involved in examples are what we call projectiles. So these bodies that undergo the projectile motion are called projectiles. So in the first case, the stone here becomes your projectile. In the next case, the bullet becomes your projectile. In the next case, the javelin also becomes your projectile. So the bodies that are involved in the projectile motion are what we call projectiles. So we can go ahead and define some terms. We'll begin with a projectile. So a body or particle that performs projectile motion is called a projectile. But because it is quite technical and the body will go through motion against gravity and motion under gravity, a better way to define a projectile is to say that a projectile is a body shot or projected into the air and left to move under the influence of gravity only. So the body is shot, pushed into the air, and it is allowed to move under the influence of gravity only. So in projectile motion, we assume that there is no air resistance. So whenever there are some questions and a projectile motion, we do not include the resistance of the air. So we assume the body has been shot into the air. It's allowed to move under the influence of the force of gravity 
only. And that is a projectile. Sometimes a projectile is also called a missile. So in some questions, you'll be, asked, you'll be told that a missile is launched, a missile is projected. It's refers or it's referring to a projectile. We can move on to trajectory. This is the path, the parabolic path described by a body that performs projectile motion. It's how you call the trajectory. So just like you follow the path taken by the projectile, that path is the trajectory. Then we go ahead to look at what we call the time of flight. The total time spent by a body or particle in air before it hits the ground. If the body was not projected from the ground and it will not come back to the ground, it will come back to the projection plane. So the total time the body spent in air before it returns to the projection plane becomes the time of flight. Now, I'm also saying that the time of flight is the time required for a body to return to the same level from which it was projected. So maybe the body was not shot up into the air from the ground. It was made from a level above the ground. So the total time the body was spend in air before it returns to that level from which it was projected becomes the time of flight. Now, I'm saying that it should be, have an illustration. I'm just trying to look at the formula for the time of flight. What is revision? Those are the things you need to know. So, if I have a body here, let me just draw this and that. The body is down here at point A, shot up into the air, moves and comes back. So it moves from A to B to C. So, there's a, there's the time of flight becomes time it takes to move from A to B plus time it takes to move from B to C, okay? Now, time to move from A to B is giving us U sine theta on G. Where theta is the angle of projection, and U is the initial velocity of projection. Now, from this sketch you have here, time to move from A to B it's equal to time to move from B to C. That means that the time of flight will be equal to two times the time to move from A to B. So what then becomes our formula for time of flight? Time of flight becomes 2U sine theta over G. That becomes our time of flight. Very simple. T equals 2U sine theta over G. Don't forget that the time taken to reach the maximum height move from A to B is U sine theta over G. Good. We look at another term, maximum height reached. Maximum height reached. I'm saying it is the highest vertical distance reached by a projectile as measured from the horizontal projection plane. The highest vertical. So look at the word vertical there, distance the highest vertical distance reached by the projectile as measured from the horizontal projection plane. Good. So, I want to look at another definition. We can say that it is the vertical distance from the plane of projection to the point where the projectile stops for a moment. Stops momentarily. Let me just give an illustration. So I have a body. From this point here, A. It goes and comes back to C. So A through to B and then to C. The maximum height which I can show in this diagram with this distance, which is let me see, H. The maximum vertical distance that the body can reach from this projection plane here is H. Now I say that the body moves from here. So when this body moves from A, it goes along this trajectory with the velocity U. 
making an angle theta with the horizontal. It goes, goes, goes. It gets to be here. From A to B, the motion is against gravity, so it's going up. A body cannot be going up and falling down at the same time. No. So it goes up, it gets to a point, it stops going up and starts falling. So from A to B, it's motion against gravity. And for B to C, it's motion under gravity. So I say that the, the maximum height reached is the vertical distance from the plane of projection. So from this plane of projection here to the point where the projectile will stop for a moment here. That is it. So from here, vertical distance to the point where it stops for a moment because it will end one motion, motion against gravity, before it starts another motion. And that becomes our maximum height reached. Now, so what is our formula? We are doing revision. We have to get these things straight up in mind or in memory. So maximum height reached H is equal to U squared sine squared theta over 2G. That is our expression for maximum height reached. So keep these expressions because you need them when questions are posed to you. We can look at the next one, the range. The range is the horizontal distance. If the word horizontal is not there, you get it wrong. We'll give you the mark. The horizontal distance from the point of projection to the point where the projector hits the projection plane. So let's try and see an illustration. Like that. So let's take this as our projection plane. Then we take a body from here, A. It goes, it goes, and comes back. So it goes from A through to B to C. Now take note that as the body moves from A, you have initial velocity U, to B, and moves from B to C, it covers a distance horizontally. And that's what we call the range from A to C. So from A to C becomes the range. Becomes the range. So it moves from A through to B and to C. And in doing so, it covers the distance horizontally A to C. And that is the range. That is the range. Very important. Making an angle theta with the horizontal. Now we move ahead. So I'm saying it is simply the horizontal distance traveled by a projectile. What then will be our formula for range? It says range is equal to u squared sine 2 theta over d. Very important. Range is equal to u squared sine 2 theta over j. Or we could say that if I should use the diagram I drew early on, just before this slide, then we can say horizontal velocity. So horizontal velocity is equal to horizontal distance. over time taking. If I try to go back to the diagram, then you're going to have horizontal velocity from this diagram is u in the x direction, so ux. And the horizontal distance is this distance, which is the range. OK? So horizontal velocity equals horizontal distance then the time taken to cover this horizontal distance, A to C, is from here to here to here to there. The time of flight. So that becomes the UX will give me the range over the time of flight. So it means that the range will give me UX times the time of flight. Don't forget that UX is the same as U cos theta. So the range could be r equals u cos theta times the time of flight. Once you have these equations, no matter how the question will come, you will be able to answer the question. Now, we can look at 
the maximum range. Good. The maximum range. Now, I had R equals U squared sine 2 theta over J. Now, the, the range will be maximum, okay, when the sine function in this expression is taken away. In that case, I mean, let us put the sine function to 1. If you put that to 1, you're going to get sine 2 theta equals 1. In that case, I'm going to get 2 theta equals sine inverse of 1. Sine inverse of 1 will give me 90. So I have 2 theta equals 90 degrees. I divide both sides by 2 because I want theta. So theta will give me 90 degrees on 2, which is 45 degrees. So the range will be maximum. So R will be maximum. R will be maximum when theta equals 45 degrees. Very important. In that case, I'm going to get R maximum equals U squared sine 2 times 45 degrees over G. 2 times 45 will give me 90. Sine 90 will give me 1. Therefore, R maximum will give me U squared on G. So whenever you are given a question, you are told that the projectile covered the maximum range, then indirectly you have been told that the angle of projection theta is not 45 degrees, sorry. The angle of projection theta is 45 degrees. Or when the question asks you, what, uh, what value of theta would give the maximum range? You say theta is equal to 45 degrees. We we'll end by looking at the factors that affect the range of a projectile. The factors that affect the range of a projectile. I'll give you about one, two, three. Then look for others for yourselves. Number one, initial velocity of projection. Why? The formula says R equals U squared. So U here is the initial velocity of projection. And it says sine 2 theta over J. So it means that the angle of projection, theta, so the first one is the initial velocity of projection, which is this U here. It will affect it. That's it. Second one, angle of projection, this theta here, will affect the range. Then the acceleration due to gravity, this is J. G here will also affect the range. So right from the expression for range, we can tell factors that affect the range of a projectile. It's now time for us to go through some past questions on what we have done so far and see if we have had a firm grasp on it. Before that, we will take a breather. We just take a short break. Get your calculators, get your pens ready, get your books ready. I'll be back in about a minute. We start solving some past questions. So we'll take a breather, we'll be back shortly. vacation and desperately want to catch up with the syllabus? Silao, sila. Don't fret because Joy Learning is giving you free extra classes not only on TV but on Zoom. Did you encounter any challenges with certain topics at school? Bring them here and we will help you get it solved with no sweat, Charlie. We are offering you a one-on-one -on -one teaching and learning opportunity with our award-winning TV teachers. Is it mathematics, general science, English language or any of the elective subjects that you had challenges with? Meet our teachers for easy solutions. How do you join these free extra classes on Zoom? One, download the Zoom app from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. Two, create your username. Three, look for our Zoom meeting password on all our social media handles every week. And voila, you are good to join our virtual classroom from the comfort of your home. Make a date with your facilitator this Saturday at 12 noon prompt. The Joy Learning teacher and you, we don't stop learning. Joy learning. Keep learning.
So you're welcome. I will be ready for us to go through some questions to see whether we have really understood the lesson so far. So our first question will appear on the screen shortly. It says, what is meant by the dimensions of, of a physical quantity? <laughs> Amazingly, why ask questions like these? Verbatim definitions, get the answer correctly, get your marks, move on with, to get your A1. So what is meant by the dimensions of a physical quantity? So we are looking at Wasi, June 2019. Question 2, this was there. Obviously, in part one. And it says the speed C of continental waves in a stretched wire is given by C. So you see, now speed is C. You see? So you stick to the definition given to you in the question. Speed is C. It's given by C equals root of E on rho. And I saw that E is Yang's modulus. So this one, if you don't know what Yang's modulus is, you can't answer the question. That is quite a huge task. But you should know that by now. If you are in Form 3 preparing for YC, you should have revised these things. Then it says that for the material, the wire and rho is its density. Show that this equation is dimensionally correct. So let's tackle the first question. What is meant by the dimensions of the quantity? I have done that one in the lesson for today. It says that the dimensions of a physical quantity are the powers to which the Fundamental quantities, mass, length, and time are raised. Now, you can't say they are the powers to which the fundamental quantities are raised. That will not give you the mark because we are not involving or we are not using all the basic or fundamental quantities in dimensions. We are only looking at three of them, mass, length, and time. So you have to mention them. So, they are the powers or the index to which mass, length, and time are raised. Let's move on to look at the next question there. Look at it very carefully again. Let's check it here. We are told that the speed relates to E and rho by C equals root of E on rho. That's all we have been told. And we'll be given the definitions so we can work from there. But take note here. It says that show that this equation is dimensionally correct. The examiner has helped you. The examiner has given you an assurance that this equation is correct dimensionally. So you don't solve the question and end up telling the examiner that the equation is not correct dimensionally. No. Because the examiner has said, show that it is correct. So it means that when we find the dimensions on the left and right hand side of this equation, they should be the same. And if they are the same, then indeed the equation is correct dimensionally. So C is equal to root of E on rho. That's what we have. So I have C is equal to E on rho. You're going to work with that one. So C is equal to square root of E on rho. The next thing I'm going to do is to find the dimensions, the dimensions of these quantities. C, according to the question, is speed. So speed is LT <coughs> minus 1. LT minus 1. Then the big one, E, is Young's modulus. Young's modulus, the formula says, so let's do it at, as an aside, then we we'll come back and then put it in there. Young's modulus E gives me. Force times length over area times extension. So FL on AE. So force gives me mass times acceleration times the length. Then you have area to be L squared times extension E is also length. So in this case, we're going to get, we're going to, Simplify this L can go away. This L, why they have the same base, same exponent. Good, so we go ahead to get E giving me M L T minus 2 times L minus 2. Don't forget, L down here has a power of 2, a denominator, it becomes a numerator minus 2. 
Finally, I'm going to get m. L is power 1. Here is power minus 2. So it will be 1 minus 2. You give me L minus 1. And T minus 2. Just like pressure. Because it has been lost. Or let's look at it. We move on. Then you have rho. Density. Mass over volume. You give me mass L minus 3. We put all these back into the expression. We get L T minus 1. Giving me M L minus 1 T minus 2. All over M L minus 3. Once again, we can simplify by cancelling out the M's. They are the same base, they have the same exponents. So I'm going to get, but don't forget that this was another square root sign. So we put everything here to the power half. Are we good to go? Yes. So LT minus 1 gives me, now I have L minus 1, T minus 2 times, this is L positive 3, right? But all to the power half. We simplify, you're going to get LT minus 1 giving me, now L, we have minus 1, and then here we have positive 3. So 1 minus 3 will give me 1 minus 1 plus 3. Minus 1 plus 3 gives me positive 2. So L2 T also minus 2 all to the power half. Now I can open the bracket multiply all the indices, each of them by half. I'm going to get L T minus 1 equals L squared times half. T minus 2 times half. Now I can be smiling. Why? My left hand side is getting just the same as the right hand side. So, mm -hmm. L, T minus 1, you give me, now these will cancel out here, that and that, and then this and that, getting minus 1 there. So I'm going to still get L, T minus 1. Bravo. Now when I get this, I'm happy, because the examiner says I should show that it is correct dimensionally. And I'm seeing that Dimensions on the left hand side are the same as those on the right hand side. So I will say the equation, the equation, the equation E C equal to root of E over rho is dimensionally correct. Good. That is it for our first question. This is a past question, and you should be able to try hands on it. Next question, question number two. It says, a bullet is fired from a gun at 30 degrees, 30 degrees to the horizontal. Very important. We have a bullet fired from a gun at 30 degrees to the horizontal. The bullet remains in flight for 25 seconds. Before touching the ground, calculate the velocity of projection. So, we can start solving this question by putting down our parameters. From the question, the bullet is fired from a gun at that angle, 30 degrees. That becomes the angle of projection. So, theta is 30 degrees. The bullet remains in flight for 25 seconds. That means the time of flight, capital T is 25 seconds. Before touching the ground, then we are asked to find the velocity of projection. So velocity of projection is denoted by u. So we have time of flight. In the expression for time of flight, you have u. So we can take that formula and try to find u. So it says t is equal to what? 2u, uh-huh, sine theta over g. So it means in this question, g will be needed, which is 10, ms minus 2. So our g is 10, ms minus 2. So what do we do? If you 
we want to find u, we have t times j will give me 2u sine theta. So I have 25 for my t is equal to 2 times u times sine 30 degrees all over 10. So we solve that one out. Sine 30 gives me 0.5 or half times 2. That will give me 1. So the numbers will give me u. So 25 times 10 will give me u. And u will give me 250 meters per second. That's quite simple. That's quite simple. That's quite simple. Very, very simple. So sine 30 will give me, from the calculator, will give me half times 2. That gives me 1. 1 times u just gives you u. Then you cross multiply 25 by 10, and that gives you 250 ms minus 1. That's it for our question number 2. You can go out and look at question number 3. Then it says, what is a projectile? This is also a past question. Was it June 2015? Question 1. What is a projectile? Then it says another thing. Give the reason why the horizontal component of the velocity of a projectile remains the same at every point of its flight. Ooh. So the question is giving us something interesting that when you pick a projectile, its component horizontally of the velocity remains the same at every point of its flight. We will take our time and look at that one because it's very important. Okay, fine. Let's pick the first one. A, what's a projectile? It says, a projectile is an object. You just look at it not long ago. An object thrown or projected into the air and left to move under the influence of gravity only. A projectile is an object thrown or projected into the air and left to move under the influence of gravity only. That's a projectile. So, if I should take the trajectory of a projectile, I'm trying to see how we can answer the next question. So, the trajectory is this way. From here, this is an inside velocity u to a to b to c. This initial velocity u is at an angle, so theta, the horizontal. It means that at every point in time, u is inclined to the horizontal. So you have a vertical component and you have a horizontal component. So if I should pick just say here, u, where the body is going up, I'll find the vertical component going up like this. Let me say u, y is that component. But the body is going up and it's going towards the right hand side. So I'll find its horizontal component, u, x, going that way. When the body gets here, it stops moving upwards for a moment. So u in the vertical direction there becomes zero. That's changed. But the body is still moving towards our right. So u in the x direction will be there, like that. Then when the body gets to me, let's say a point down here, the body is now coming downwards. So its velocity in the vertical direction, u, y, will be coming down. But this u, x, the body is still going to our right. So you can see that at this point, the body is moving from A to B. It's, it's motion against gravity. Therefore, Uy will be decreasing. The initial velocity, its component in the vertical direction will be decreasing as it moves from A to B. Then you see, it becomes zero at this point here. So you see, it's decreasing, becomes zero at this point B because it starts moving upwards for a moment. Then it starts moving downwards. Therefore, at this point, Uy is increasing because it's now moving under gravity. 
So it's increasing. That's okay. What of UX? Look at UX. Look at where it is now. It's UX here. It's UX here. It's UX here. And according to the question, this component, let's go back to the question. It says, give the reason why the horizontal component of the velocity of projection remains the same. So this component I'm talking about here is UX. And UX remains the same throughout the motion. It's here, it's here, it's there, it's the same. Why? The answer is that whether the body is moving against gravity A to B or under gravity B to C, <clears throat> the ascension to gravity will not influence it because it does not act in the horizontal direction. So the answer is that the acceleration due to gravity or acceleration of free fall due to gravity does not act in the horizontal direction. Because it does not act in the horizontal direction, Ux will remain constant throughout the motion. So our answer will be that the let me use the right one. Acceleration of free fall due to gravity, which is a small g, okay, does not act. does not act in the horizontal direction. Does not act in the horizontal direction. That is the reason for which the initial velocity, its component in the horizontal direction, remains constant throughout the motion. So the initial, the component of the initial uh, velocity acting in the x direction, acting horizontally, the component of the initial velocity acting horizontally remains constant throughout the motion of a projectile because small g, as you due to free fall or due to gravity, does not act in the horizontal direction. The acceleration of free fall due to gravity does not act in the horizontal direction. Okay, we can move on and look at the next question. It says that a body is projected at an angle of 30 degrees. That is question number four for us. Here it is WASI, June 2015, question number two. A body is projected at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal with a velocity of 150 Yes, per second. Calculate the time it takes to reach the greatest height. In other words, time it takes to reach the maximum height. So we are asked to calculate. Then we have been given additional information. Take J to be 10 ms minus 2, and we should neglect air resistance. We should neglect air resistance. All right. So we can solve this question in two ways. I solve this question in two ways. So, what are those two ways? Let's pick the first one. Before that, let's put our parameters. Be given the angle of projection. So, theta is giving me 30 degrees. Be given the initial velocity of projection, u to be 150 ms minus 1. Then, of course, g is there 10 ms minus 2. So, I can just write down my formula for time taken to reach the greatest height, which is the time it, moves, it takes to move to the maximum height. And that is T is giving me U sine theta over J. So, T will simply give me, what's my U? 150 
times sine, what's our theta? 30 degrees over 10. Good. And T will give me 150 times sine 30. Okay, divided by 10. I'm getting my answer to be 7.5 seconds. So 7.5 seconds. That is one way we could solve this question. Is that not simple? It is simple. Or we use Newton's third equation or first equation of motion will do for us. For projectile motion. The normal equation we have for Newton's uh, equation of motion. The first equation says V is equal to, this time the projectile is moving up against gravity. So the body is moving up against gravity. So V equals to U minus GT. But we have to modify this a little bit to solve our question because this is for a projectile motion. And so the velocities are looking at vertical velocity, finally, and the initial velocity also there. So Vy, Uy. And Uy is U sine theta. So you can get Vy equals U sine theta minus GT. Good. Don't forget that at the maximum height, the final velocity of the body becomes zero. So Vy will give me zero. Is that okay with us? Yes, it is. So it means that this is going to give me zero is equal to u sine theta minus g t. Then we are going back to our equation that we used. So I can put zero here. What's our u? Our u was given to us as 150 times sine 50 degrees minus 10 times t. Are we good to go? Good. So 150. That gives now I'll bring minus 10t across to get positive 10t is equal to sine 30 times 150. And that's giving us 75. So we divide both sides by 10. So 10t on 10 is equal to 75 on 10. What do we do? We cancel out. That and that. So I'm going to get T is equal to 75 until we give me 7.5 seconds. You see, just like we solved the earlier on. Did I code the formula T because you said about G straight away? Or we go ahead and we look at it using the first equation of motion. We modify it to suit that of projectile motion and then we solve. We're going to look at the last question, after which I'm going to give you the chance to call in and answer the problem of the day, which is just along these lines. So, let's look at the last question, then it will be time to announce the phone lines so that you could call in and answer the problem of the day. Now, it says state the dimensions of. Now, obey the rudiments of the question. It says state. So sometimes students worry themselves, they go and do too much. They say, just state it. So you do the work aside somewhere and write your answers in your answer booklet. So we are asked to state the dimensions of impulse for acceleration and for work. So I'm also going to just obey that. But because I'm showing you how to go about it, I'll try and solve it for you to see if I put the answers there. So we start with that of impulse, 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 okay. What is impulse? So impulse is force times time. Of course, impulse is about changing momentum too. But I can use force and time. We are not asked to prove, we are asked to just write. So I'm doing this as an aside. Force is mass times acceleration. So I'm writing the dimension for impulse. Like that. Then time is T. That gives me M L T minus 2 plus 1 minus 1. So I'll just come here and say impulse is M L T minus 1. For acceleration, we know already. So I'm using L, T, minus 2. Then, work. 
work is said to be done when a force applied causes a load to move through a distance in the direction of the force. So work will just give us force times distance. So this is an aside. It's not part of my work. I'll just get this and put the answer somewhere else. So mass times acceleration times distance. Now you have M, L, L here, so L squared, T minus 2. So work will just give me M, L squared, T minus 2. M, L squared, T minus 2. So, we have been able to solve some fast questions. These have gone or spread across what we've given to you as problem of the day. So by now, you should be able to get us answers for problem of the day. I am just going to take my last break for tonight, after which I'll announce the phone lines. We have just about 20 minutes maximum to solve the problem of the day, and then we will call it an evening. So get your solutions ready. The phone lines will announce shortly, then you can phone in or call in and give me your solution. So just give me a minute and I'll be back with you with a problem of the day. Alright, so 
we have the problem of the day. We are told a projectile is launched with an initial velocity of 60 ms minus 1. In the meantime, we have the lines shown on your screen. 030 2211705, You can call in and solve this problem, problem you have on your screen. But before that, until that, I will be talking about the problem and be looking at how we can solve it and then we move on. So 030-2211705, 030-2211706. So as I was, I was saying, we are told that a projectile is launched with an initial velocity of 60 ms minus 1. So we'll be giving the velocity of projection to be 60 ms minus 1 at an angle of 40, 40 degrees above the horizontal. So the angle of projection is 40 degrees. So you can put this down like U is equal to 60 ms minus 1. Then theta is 40 degrees. We are asked to find the horizontal displacement of the projectile after 3 seconds. So we have time. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Your name, please, and where you're calling from? My name is Jones. I'm calling from Aku. My name is Jones? Yes. Calling from where? Bremen. Bremen Jones, you're welcome to the revision show. Are you going to help us solve the question? Yes, sir. Thank you, Jones. Please go ahead. Okay. Sir. The horizontal displacement. Okay. I had my answer to you. Okay, I think we've lost Jones, but before you call him, please kindly, kindly mute the volume of your TV set or your device you are watching as via, and please mute the volume of that device and just listen via or through the phone so that we can have a very smooth conversation. Thank you for helping us out. So get your TV set or your device volume muted so that we can talk through or via the phone line. So we move on. We'll be giving time to be three seconds. And we are asked to find horizontal displacement of the projectile. That's our A. So A says horizontal displacement. of the projector maybe i can give it s but in the x or horizontal direction so s x i have isaac on the line good evening isaac it looks like we've lost isaac too keep trying we hope to get you through the show so i want to say s in the horizontal direction now take note that this is not the range it is asking you how far the body has gone horizontally after three seconds so this is not the range be very careful with how you go about this question Okay, so we're still waiting to get you on the lines. So we are going to look at the equations of motion that will help us to solve this question. S, displacement. We'll be giving U, initial velocity of projection. We'll be giving a time. Okay, then we also have G at our disposal. But mind you, this is horizontal distance we're talking about so in considering this distance because gravity does not act in the horizontal direction it's not going to play so much of a role in solving this question so very very important so we could just say s script x is equal to u x t Okay, 
Should I say minus or plus? Well, because I'm going to look at it's going up and down. Either way should help us to so plus half gt squared. Why either way will help us? Because if it's minus, it doesn't really affect the right hand side of the equation or the other part of the equation, which is half gt squared here. Because g is not included. But we are looking at uxt. So if g is equal to zero because g is not acting in the horizontal direction, then that equation or this equation here reduces to s x equals u x times t. That's very important. But again, u x is u cos theta. So on the face of the question, it looks so simple. But then you have to apply a deeper understanding. So in that case, I'm going to get a S X equals U cos theta times T. So now we can put in our values. You get S X equals what are you? 60 times cos 40 times 3. So 60 times cos 40 times 3. Woo! I have 137.88799 and moves on. So I would say 137.9 and the unit will be meters. Okay, hello, good evening. May I know them, please, and where I'm calling from? May you, may you speak up for us, please? Yeah. What's your name, please? Daniel. Daniel. Yes. Daniel, where are you coming from, please? Please, I'm calling from Aguna Shedu. Aguna Shedu. Okay, Daniel, go ahead. You want to help us solve the question? Okay, please, the question I'm not asking. Come again. The question I'm not asking. I can't hear you. I can't see the question. Okay, that's the question on the uh, screen. Can you see it? Yes. Fine, so you can go ahead and let's see. Please, verse 1. Okay. Okay. Uh, we can't really hear you, so kindly position yourself well and speak up. Hello, Hello. Daniel. Hello. Yeah, Daniel, can you speak up? We want to hear you. So we've lost Daniel too, but I have done justice to the first part of the question. I've been able to give you the horizontal displacement of the projectile after three seconds. And this is how we go about it. We pick up this equation, S equals UT plus half GT squared. But because you are looking at horizontal displacement, we give it a subscript X. So X there, X here. And because G does not act in the horizontal direction or x direction, g becomes zero. You get u x times t. u x is u cos theta. So u cos theta times t. We put in the values and we get our answer. Quickly, we are asked to do a second thing the height reached by the projectile. Here to again after three seconds. So b says height reached by projectile after three seconds how do you go about it this is vertical displacement so i'm going to use the same equation i used in the first case but this time but this time you're looking at vertical displacement so i'm going to say s is equal to ut again you have a problem Minus half g t squared. Why? I'm going up to the maximum height. So you're going up against gravity. So it's minus, but vertically. So s y u y. 
U Y is U sine theta. And T has been given to us to be 3. We put it in. S Y will give me 60 sine. So U times T times T. So that's 3. Then it is U sine theta. So let me just put my sine theta there before I bring my 3. So 60 times sine theta, which is 40 degrees, times 3. Good. Minus half, so the whole thing here, times 10. Genes is now acting times 3 squared. Good. That will give me my answer. You punch this out, and that will give you 70. 0.7 meters. That's quite simple. So this time the same equation, but now there is gene and we are going up against gravity. So minus. Let's be the last equation that we can go. Hello, caller. Good evening. Good evening. Can you please speak up? I can't really hear you. What's your name and where you're calling from, please? My name is Tom Dinam. We can't hear you at all, please. Ham Dinam. Ham Dinam. Yes. Can you please uh, speak up for us? My name is Hamdinat. So where are you coming from, please? We are getting a feedback from you. Can you put off the volume of your set so that we can hear from the uh, phone? Okay. So that we can hear you, please. We can't hear you. I'm from All right, so we have the last question on the screen, and we are asked to find the units of momentum using dimensions. So, from the expression, we try and make momentum the subject. So, we go ahead. We have Ke giving us P squared on 2m. So, what we do, we are trying to make momentum the subject so that we can find its units. So I'm going to get 2 ta m times ke, and that will give me momentum squared. So momentum will just give us square root of 2m times ke. That means I'm going to get 2m times ke or to the power half. 2 is a dimensionless constant, so we leave it out. So we're going to get m for the mass times ke. We're giving the unit of ke in the question. It says ke is kilogram meter squared second squared. So kilogram for mass, then meter squared for L, which is length squared. And then it says per second squared. So time to minus 2. But all to the power half. That's very good to go. All to the power half. So we move on. Then we're going to get Ke giving us m times m to give me m squared. Then L squared. T minus 2 all to the power half. That gives me M squared times half L squared times half. Then T minus 2 also times half. That will give me M L because they are going to cancel out. So this goes out with this. This with this. And then this will give me minus 1. So I'll give me M L T minus 1. Therefore, we say, therefore, the unit of momentum is for mass, m here, it's kilogram. For length, l here is meter. And for time, t here is second. But you have minus 1, so minus 1. So kilogram, meter per second. That is all time is going to permit for tonight. I believe those of you who followed keenly, you have really gone through 
a very good time of revision. When it comes to preparing for this year's WASI, we've got you covered here on the Joy Learning TV. So, we have the revision show coming your way every day of the weekdays, from Mondays through to Fridays. Stay glued to your sets. Catch us again another time at 7.30 p.m. on our YouTube channel, Joy Learning Television, or on Facebook, Joy Learning Television. And so I come your way another time. I wish you all the best. Have a good night and take very care of yourselves. See you again.